Oke. Good afternoon to everybody. Welcome back. We are now here to continue our, uh, our uh, um, teaching sessions, our lectures, and after having uh, completed the third work session earlier this morning. Uh, we have the honor to start with Mrs. Despina Dimeli, professor, associate professor at the Technical University of Crete. Uh, and uh, director and founder of the Urban and Regional Planning Laboratory. Uh, Mrs. Dimeli will present a lecture with the title uh, uh, Case Studies on Management, Design and Use of Public Space in Greece, the case of Hanya. Mrs. Dimeli, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. I'm sorry I couldn't be there today, but I had some obligations, uh, teaching obligations again, as you know. Uh, it is an honor for me to be with you, even distant, in a distant way. And uh, I wish the best for uh, your workshop. Um, the only problem I have is that I still cannot share my screen. So if you can fix that, because uh, uh, okay. I have a message that says uh, that I cannot share my screen. One, so one second, can... we will check it immediately. Okay. okay. So as, as uh, long as you are checking it, I will say that I, uh, Mrs. Korafa sent me the, I mean, everything is great now, so I think it's okay. I will say that Mrs. Korafa sent me the results of the previous, uh, of your previous sessions, and they were quite interesting. And I think that we can discuss about some of these uh, subjects. So here, um, today I wish, uh, uh, try to be brief and uh, show you the, some case studies from Kenya, some proposals for Kenya City, and uh, some general things about the open public spaces in Greece. Uh, so we are all present in Kenya because we live in Kenya, we have done our research in Kenya, but if we go back and take a brief look, we can see that the public spaces uh, have been the areas of important interest, and their planning has changed through the years. For the ancient Greek period, to the Roman period, or even to the recent period, we can say that the uh, urban public space have been essential parts of the city, the place where people meet each other, the place where democracy was, was expressed, the place where even today 
people stay in the public spaces and, the, and they still have the need to meet each other in the public spaces. So they are important elements of the urban tissue. And the, although their role has not changed a lot, their planning has changed through the centuries. And uh, when we say, when we talk about the role, and here I'm showing the, the, the most important uh, open space of Greece, this is the Syntagma Square, the public square. This is a place that is uh, uh, next to the parliament. It is it's surrounded by users of retail, of hotels, of restaurants. And it is the most important urban sp public space of Greece, but through the years has faced a lot of challenges. Challenges uh, as people go there to celebrate in Christmas or in, in, in any other anniversaries, as people go there to protest and uh, show that uh, they are, as we are living in a democratic country, this is a place, the public space is the place where we all go there and show what our needs are and what our beliefs are. Uh, so they, public spaces have a very important role that differs according to uh, the periods, according to history, according to their category. Uh, in the Greek cities, uh, this is something that is directly connected with the way the Greek cities have been shaped through the centuries. We can see all categories of public spaces, from the large scale ones to the even smaller scale, scale ones, as you can see in the last picture. And what we can see is that the, there is always the need for more public spaces. Um, the way the Greek cities have been formed through the centuries uh, shows that, uh, for example, what we see here in this uh, slide, in the first picture, we see the Pedio Tuareos, a very important part of Greece uh, that was planned and uh, it was uh, functioning, it has been functioning through the, uh, since the 19th century. But through the years, public spaces are even more and more necessary, but their scale differs as so there's not enough space where they can be developed. And what, all, what we all also see is the threats. The public spaces face a lot of threats. One of basic threats is their privatization. There has been a lot of discussion about the Elinco project, the former um, airport, that is today a big challenge for Athens, as it can be the biggest part of uh, the country, but still, due to uh, issues of management, it was, um, uh, it was given to the private sector and it will function in a different way. And other, other issues as uh, abandonment, uh, as the place of, for the homeless, as uh, the place where the poverty is expressed. And that is something that we have seen intensively in the recent years, the years of the economic crisis, uh, where all the social and economic problems that Greek society was facing were reflected in its public spaces. And the opportunities here in Greece to have the chance to have, we are lucky enough that we still try to make better public spaces, more livable public spaces, or not invent new spaces, but even upgrade the ones we already have. And there are a lot of proposals, proposals for uh, the improvement of the existing public spaces with criteria that are mostly bioclimatic. So there are many, there are, through the years, many proposals have been um, uh, formulated regarding creating better existing public spaces and the other um, effort is, uh, is to invent new public spaces to take um, empty spaces in the city and make them public and make them function in a better way and uh, what we can see here is uh, something that the uh, municipality of Athens is uh, uh, developing in the recent uh, one and a half year and it is a program that is called adopt your city and this program um, has been so far uh, functioning in a very good way. Uh, the basic idea is that uh, there has been a call from the municipality to individuals or uh, companies to uh, adopt a, pub a, a public space that has no role today and uh, reform it into a public space that is more vi uh, more vibrant, it is more livable, and it is a public space for everyone. And the basic idea is that this individual or this company will manage, will have the management of the public space. And so this is a program that can be a great opportunity for someone. 
uh, as um, it gives the, the private sector the uh, opportunity through partnerships to revive, to make again public spaces basic course uh, of the city. And these are some, these are some examples. I uh, was saying that this is a successful uh, example because so far many parks have been created that way. And we can see here the actual view how the situation was before the project and how it is today. Small pocket parks that are for the people who are living next to them uh, that are simply uh, planned. Um, and they can, they are, uh, their management is uh, given to the, to the private sector. And this is a great partnership that has been working so far here in Athens in a better way. And here we can see another example where we can see what, what, how the place was before and how it is today. So I'm just showing this uh, for this uh, slides because I think uh, according to how we experts evaluate the public space, but this is a very good opportunity that uh, until today has shown us some good examples of the management of the public space. But then we have to go back to Kenya because uh, I think now I'm showing you examples from Athens. But what do we do about uh, the city we live and we work in? And this is uh, the city of Kenya. And in this map, we can see the basic urban, uh, urban spaces, public spaces. So we can see. The, the open spaces, the green spaces, and um, according to some research we have done, we have seen that uh, uh, as it is estimated that about uh, that for every citizen of the city, about uh, 1.8 uh, square meters is the public space, and this is something that uh, should uh, worry the authorities because according to the National Health Organization, uh, the proportion must be nine square meters for its citizen of Kenya. So what we see as a first uh, uh, result is that there is a lack of public spaces. So the first uh, result is that the public spaces have to be increased. The second one is that if you see this smart, we can see that they are not developed in, a, in an equal way. For example, we, have see, we see that there are areas uh, of the city that do not have public spaces at all. So we can see a concentration in the historic core. This concentration is directly connected to the city, to the history of the city. But on the contrary, there are very important uh, neighborhoods that do not have public spaces at all. And this is something that should be planned again. This is something that is very difficult to be achieved. But at the same time, this is a great challenge for us, plan for us uh, special planners. And if we go back to Kenya, if we go some centuries ago, this is a map of uh, 1689 uh, that shows how in the Venetian period the city of Kenya was developed. And the basic idea is that the public spaces were the spaces next to the churches, as the church was the essential part of the city. The places where the churches were, the open space next to the church was the public space was the most important place for the citizens of Kenya by that period. In the next years, the city was developing, was constantly developing, was um, constructed in a sprawled way. So you can see here in an aerial photo of 1939, the historic center. Uh, we can see the malls, we can see uh, the stadium that, was con that had been constructed already. This is the area of the sport facilities. And on the other hand, we can see that the entire city, the, the rest city, had been developed in an arbitrary way, in a scrolled way. And it is quite impressive that there were no specific plans by this period that would define the public spaces of the city. And, there the, and then they were, they were, we had the proposals. This is a proposal that was formulated in 1977, which based the development of the city of Kanya to its history. And the basic idea was the creation of an archaeological park uh, where all the, um, the remains of Hanya's history uh, would uh, constitute a, a public urban space, uh, which would uh, combine green areas, public areas, and the uh, areas of archaeological interest. This was a plan that was formulated in 1977. It was innovative by, for its period, but unfortunately, it was never uh, applied. This plan showed uh, that 
the historic city should be developed in a different way than the way it was later constructed. And it showed that uh, the open, the public space would be a very good, a very important chance for the city, not only to uh, have a better quality of life, but at the same time to connect urban public spaces with history, with the city's history. And uh, this direction would be essential because it would reveal the important uh, history of the city. This uh, plan was never applied, still some of the public services used its basic uh, ideas, but uh, unfortunately, many, uh, very few of its proposals were applied, and as we can see from the public spaces, uh, most of them were not applied as uh, there had to be intense demolitions in the city, and this was uh, a decision that is very hard for someone to make. But some years later, the, the, the proposal came back, and it was uh, formulated in another way, Still, the basic idea was the same, and it proposed that the public spaces that could be essential parts of the city that would combine history and uh, urban development of this period. This was this plan formulated in 1994. Still, some, many few of its direct, uh, very few of its directions were applied, but we can see that it reflects the need to make uh, the, some of the existing public spaces work better and at the same time develop new public spaces as they would uh, be the elements that would reveal the, until the important historic part of the city. And this is the plan that is today, uh, what is today the, the existing plan, which was legislated in 1988, so it was legislated a long time ago, and it shows the basic urban uh, public spaces of the city of Kanya. As we can see, we can see the public spaces with the green color. They are very few. Uh, the basic idea was that uh, as the city was constantly expanding and as uh, the scenarios showed that the population would constantly increase, public space was a luxury. And what was important was to uh, achieve uh, more constructions. What was important was to make another infrastructure. And on the other hand, the public space uh, were degraded. Uh, there was no, so there was not so much attention to the creation of public spaces. So what happens today? The public spaces of Panya are quite limited, or sometimes they're overloaded, or sometimes they're abandoned. And as I said before, every open space reflects the society. So we can see here uh, the, the places for pedestrians that are limited. We can see here the overcrowded uh, Venetian port uh, that uh, in, you know, specifically during the summer period is quite overcrowded. So uh, there are issues about this, its management. We can see that there are abundant places, for example, the Marco Polo, um, Area which have been which has been abandoned can be abandoned can be a great opportunity for the city to have a big park, but still there are efforts that have to be done in order to make the to make this area a new park for the city, and we can see that the public spaces reflect the society. We can see the homeless. We can see uh, how the economic crisis is reflected to the city, and th these are issues that have to be solved. On the other hand, we can see that uh, as, uh, as for the history of Panya and the, its connection with the public spaces, some efforts have been made. For example, in the first two pictures, we can see uh, the, the Xenia Hotel, which was initially constructed in the, on the Mons. Uh, the basic idea by that period, which was about the 1970, 1980, uh, the basic idea was that the city should focus on its tourist development. So whatever was historic, whatever was public. This was just a detail. The basic idea was to construct more and more because uh, this way the economy would be upgraded. But this was um, a way of thinking that was abandoned in the next years. The second picture shows that the moon was uh, full again as the hotel was demolished. And this was uh, a victory of the citizens of Panya as um, uh, the basic idea was to make public again what was once public so that the private sector 
would go uh, would not uh, take the public uh, areas again. And you can see again how the parking places have been developing and how the the need. Uh, for this kind of development against the urban sustainability, uh, against the urban, sustainable urban mobility ideas is today functioning. We can see public spaces that are um, contested by cars, by parked cars. Uh, or what we can uh, have in, as an assessment is that uh, there are a lot of things that need to be done. Um, things that have to do with the areas, uh, the existing public areas uh, upgrading, and the need for uh, making new public spaces again uh, in other areas of the city. Uh, so, uh, towards this direction, I can I will show you today uh, two examples of two main public uh, spaces of Panya. Uh, the one is Agora Public Square, public square. I, I assume you have been there because it's the center of the city. Uh, it is uh, the public space that was initially um, a bastion. It was uh, demolished. It was, uh, there was the Porta Retenota. During the Venetian period, it was the main gate of uh, now towards Retino. And this was uh, a bastion that was demolished. And in its place, the Agora. Um, uh, building was constructed, it was a very important building for its period. And in the next years, it was the center of uh, social life for the people of Panya. Uh, so what we can see is that it's a, it is a very important uh, public space, uh, but in the next year, kept this, the next years kept its role. For example, we can see some pictures of uh, the public square in 1949, we can see some proposals uh, regarding its upgrading. Uh, in 1972, unfortunately, they were not applied. And we can see how today this uh, place has been developed. It, is, it has some, some plants, it is the main entrance towards the Agora, which is uh, the traditional uh, retail center of Kanya. Uh, and what we did with our research is that we tried to evaluate uh, how the users of this public space um, they, what the users of this public space think about the, the think about its quality. Here you can see another. Uh, and in the second uh, part of the research, we made the research on another uh, important public square. Square. This is an 1868 public square. That's the name. The name was uh, a date. But it is uh, also a very important public square of Panya. Not uh, so important as Agora, but still one of its most basic public spaces. And this was a place that was initially just, as we can see in this picture, that was initially just an open space. But in the next years, as we can see in the picture of 1950, uh, it had a very interesting plan uh, with plants. Uh, it, and in the next years, it became a point of uh, meeting for the people of Kenya. Today, this uh, public square remains as an important public square of Kenya, but it uh, has a lot of issues regarding its use. So our research was based on what and how what the users believe about these two public squares, these two very important public squares of Kenya, the public square of Agora and the public square of 1966. And what we did was initially uh, see what the uses that were developed along uh, were developed in the, close to these public spaces were developed. And we saw that the basic uses for uses of recreation, a lot of uh, cafeterias, a lot of um, restaurants, uh, retail shops. So these uses were supporting the public character of the places, and the public spaces were supporting these uses. And we had seen that uh, this functional character that has been developed has been assisted by the public spaces, and at the same time, they were assisting the existence of these public spaces. So there was a a relation uh, between the uses and between the public spaces. So well, that fact was expected as we, are, as we were working in the center of Kanya. But on the next uh, step, we did an assessment. And this assessment was assessment yes, was with questionnaires. So the research team tried to uh, use the questionnaires and they were there. It was a period before the, the COVID pandemic. And they were asking the users of the place 
uh, what their basic um, ideas were about the square and uh, what were problems and what they thought were the problems of the uh, public square. And what was quite impressive that is, was that um, more specifically in the place of uh, Agora, the Agora public square, uh, the, the users uh, focused on different qualities. For example, you can see by the shapes of the circles, the intensity of the uh, phenomenon. So they, we see that um, in, in the places uh, that were not so central in the public space of Agora, uh, the users uh, thought that they felt more uh, fear uh, regarding the use of the public space. Uh, the basic idea was that the way the, the Agora square was planned was decisive for its function. So we focused that on the um, uh, urban infrastructures of the Agora, and they said that they could be improved. And they said that they were feeling sometimes a little bit strange because of a lot of immigrants and the homeless that were gathering in the area. And some of them had issues regarding their safety. Uh, fortunately, very few uh, felt these issues. But the basic idea was that even in the same public square, you, uh, the, same, the most central public square of uh, Hanya, uh, so it's um, sub areas had the, uh, the users had some had conceived in a different way the basic uh, I, the basic elements of these areas. So this quality of research was quite important because it showed us um, the inefficiencies and the advantages of the public square of Agora. So what we had as a result is that there were areas that had to be replanted. Uh, there were areas that needed to be um, upgraded, uh, that needed to be upgraded. And on the, on the other hand, there were areas of the same public square uh, that were uh, quite, um, that were okay according to, to the users. And this was the, uh, the quality research for the first uh, public square. Then on the other public square, the 8066 public square of Panya, uh, the results were quite different. And this had to do with uh, the fact that uh, this public square has a different character. It is an area where many immigrants are gathering. This, this is something that is no, it's not negative at all. But uh, for some uh, users, this makes them feel un unfriendly uh, for the environment of the public square. And the other conclusions were that the area had to, the, the open public space had to be replanted. And uh, sometimes uh, they, there were issues of safety and violence. So uh, the, the conclusion was that uh, there should be more, um, more, restri more restrictions, more proposals that would uh, ensure the safety and the feeling of uh, belonging to the users. This is another interesting thing, the place making, how we can make the users be more familiar with the place they are uh, visiting. And uh, the basic idea was that uh, from this uh, assessment that took place uh, in, the, in these two public squares, what we understood was that uh, there had to be, uh, there were many problems that had to be solved regarding the quality, the feeling of safety, uh, the proposal for better infrastructures that would make them uh, more friendly uh, to the users of Panya, the, uh, the these two basic public squares. Uh, so I was showing this today because uh, as the basic theme uh, of the workshop is the, the um, evaluation of the public space, I think it can be helpful to make them understand that um, it's not. Uh, it's very important to recognize the uh, qualities that are existing. It's important to recognize how the you what the users think about the public space, and this is uh, important. Um, and this is why it is important to see through participatory processes what can be done. Uh, my opinion is that this is a very important issue because uh, in Greece the basic idea is that we. Uh, we propose, mostly architects propose uh, plans for public squares, but on the contrary, there is not a dialogue between uh, the, the planners and the stakeholders. And uh, 
I will, uh, I will try to be as brief as possible because I, my time is almost finishing. Uh, so I'm going to show you some proposals that we have uh, done with my research team. And these were two proposals for two public spaces in uh, Hanya. Uh, they were awarded in the international uh, competition of, uh, it was called the Green Oasis, that was uh, organized by Greenpeace. And the basic idea was that uh, the students had to propose some public spaces which, which would be uh, sustainable, which would be friendly, uh, which would um, take into consideration the local uh, plants, uh, which, would be, which would be not be uh, expensive to, uh, to, to, to be applied. And the basic, these are two basic ideas uh, that were awarded, the basic proposals that were awarded. The first proposal was in Agora, the central public square I was talking to you about, uh, which has today in its uh, park a parking, and it is in great proximity to the school. And the basic idea of, the, of our team was to create green spaces, green corridors, uh, flows for uh, visitors and for uh, the, the students that, were, that are uh, in the school. And the basic idea was to propose uh, places to sit, places to stay, places to play, as we, are, as we were working on a place that was um, next to the school. And the, the, the inspiration is that a, a parking cannot be a, a, a place uh, in the center of the city. So towards this direction, the students uh, uh, proposed green corridors, green flows, and uh, what they did was um, uh, to, to change public space that today is functioning as a parking and make it a more uh, lively place for the city's residents, for the students. As, as I said before, it was uh, it is a place that is next to a school, um, and make an area that is better for the city, city the Kenya citizens everyday needs. And these are some uh, details of the proposal where you can see the playgrounds, we can see the local plants, plants, <laughs> and we can see uh, the different levels that are developed. And this was the first uh, uh, proposal that was awarded. And the second proposal that was also awarded was again in the idea of a public park of a small public space. Uh, it is in the area where the hospital that used to exist in Hanya was demolished. So there was uh, a leftover, an open space with no meaning, with no role. And the basic proposal was to create again a pocket park, a small scale uh, green area where the, the team recognized there was a need for the green area in this uh, side of the city, as it had a lot of residents but no public spaces at all. So, the basic idea is to take into advantage what is existing and upgrade it into something that is public and uh, sustainable. And the basic idea was to propose again some flows, flows of green, flows of, um, uh, for pedestrians. Uh, there were um, sunsets because here in Crete the basic problem is that the, um, the sun is quite intense, so it is sometimes difficult for someone to stay in an open space for a long time, uh, more specifically during summer. And this was the idea to make another uh, empty, uh, useless, uh, existing uh, plot into a public space that can be, that can combine, again, playgrounds that can have water. This is the element of the water. As, uh, this area was close to the sea, so there was a connection with the element of the water. And again, uh, the basic idea was to use local plants and to make, again, a bi bioclimatic uh, proposal, which would make this uh, park an interesting area that's, uh, that people could, um, could uh, uh, use. So here we can see some details of the proposal. Uh, so uh, again, you can see the, the details of the proposal. So I'm closing this presentation and uh, what I think is that it is important for Hanya to have many uh, and uh, uh, of great quality public spaces. This is something we have seen that is missing from the city. 
Uh, the second important element that I want to point out is that it is a great opportunity to connect the history to the open public spaces, that is to say, to reveal the archaeological elements of the city through uh, areas that can uh, work as attractors for visitors, but for residents as well. And uh, that it is important um, to replan the city. And I'm saying that because uh, the most uh, uh, usual way of uh, developing is that uh, the Greeks first construct their cities, construct their houses, and then they remember that they have to invent uh, public spaces. So it's very difficult to go back and try to find empty places and make public spaces. And uh, what, everyone, what we as planners believe is that planning has to be first. It has initially the state has to be the one who decides uh, the public spaces. So and keep the public spaces, and then the construction should follow, and not be followed. Uh, so. Uh, I think that uh, this is uh, where the basic uh, elements of my presentation. I think it is important to uh, find what is needed and uh, uh, try with uh, simple steps, uh, with uh, economic solutions, uh, uh, solutions that are friendly to the citizens, try to find uh, ways for uh, upgrading to the public spaces. And my final um, I notice that uh, it's all, it, it all has to be participatory. Until now, the Greek urban systems, uh, system uh, goes in a different way. The experts decide and plan. But uh, the European experience and uh, the other experiences from other cities of Greece that are uh, functioning, uh, that are working on more innovative solutions shows that participatory planning can, can be uh, more effective uh, and uh, it can proceed to better urban public urban spaces. So, uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I would be glad to, if I may open the door for discussion. Thank you, Ms. Dimeli, uh, for the enlightening presentation and the uh, and for having given us so, so many rich uh, examples, uh, such a presentation of rich examples that allowed us to see all of the possibilities and potentialities in, the, in, Hanya, in Greece and in Hanya. Thank you very much. Uh, does anybody have any question? Good. Uh, una, one second. This is Chiara Martinucci, our colleague from the UN Habitat. Hello. Hi. Thank you so much Hi. for the presentation. Do you hear me? Yes, yes, Dara. Okay, I hear you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, really nice to see that uh, some uh, uh, public space assessment that was also been done previously. And actually, I see some opportunities to merge a bit uh, the, the data that you have uh, uh, collected and try perhaps to make uh, the exercise of today uh, I mean, the exercise that we've been doing with the students this week, uh, maybe also compare it with, with the things that has been done previously and see if there are things that can be like integrated. Uh, I just would like to ask you uh, like uh, two questions. First, uh, I see you show a map of the, of the different public spaces that has in uh, like a satellite image. Uh, and I was wondering where did you uh, get uh, those data, if those are layers from the municipality or uh, that uh, you have collected uh, uh, through observations. And then uh, when it comes, uh, the second question, when it comes to uh, the observation that you have done, I was wondering was actually, what, what was the methodology that you have used? What the, like, was it through observation or you have done also other uh, interviews or other type of uh, uh, data gathering methods? Thank you. Yes, uh, if you are talking about this map, uh, this yes. uh, map is, uh, we have made this map, so we have seen, we have uh, uh, seen the, the most important public spaces of Kanya. And this is a, a KMZ file we have done in the, in the Google Earth uh, program, and it's something that we can give you. 
Um, the second step is to um, evaluate which are, for, for, for me, this map has to be finished and has to be improved. And uh, uh, so in a different way, which are the most important ones and which are functioning uh, in a secondary role. So this is something that we have been working on as a, as a laboratory, and but we still have uh, well, there are still things that have to be done so that we can have the complete uh, image. And what the basic idea here is that we were we are um, uh, gathering the data about the open spaces, the open public spaces, and the uh, in the parks. Uh, for example, there are very important issues that can be added. Uh, as I said during the presentation, for me, a very good uh, opportunity for the municipality um, is uh, the abandoned. Uh, I need your help with that. I, I, I am stuck with the word stratopedal. Oh, I have to find the word. It's an abandoned area where the army was. And I, I'm sorry, I am a bit. Uh, so, and it, it, it is a. Um, uh, uh, an area that is uh, empty and can be a very important part for the city. So this map is uh, our initial effort to to, report, to to write down what it is, but we can add it, we can add things and we can collaborate and uh, add a lot of things that we still have uh, uh, in our research but do not have enough time to show for today. Uh, I, I didn't understand the second question. If you want to make it clear, you asked me about the methodology of the assessment. Yes. Yes. Well, what are the methods that you use to assess the public spaces? Uh, yes, uh, we divided the, um, for, uh, the, this assessment uh, was uh, uh, took place. I didn't say that I, I will add it now. It took place in 2018, so it was before the pandemic. And the method that we used is that we uh, tried to find some uh, layers uh, that were in, that we wanted to point out. For example, I, as we are in the School of Architecture, but we also uh, teach urban planning, it was important for us to see uh, the urban infrastructures, how the urban furniture were uh, functioning. So we had a category with questions about uh, the way the, the area was planned, but at the same time, uh, we had the second division uh, that was how you feel about uh, the area, what would you propose about the area. There were a, a lot of uh, there were groups of questions. And the basic aim is to, to see um, two basic things. Uh, the ones that uh, were, um, that had to do with the existing uh, things in the public squares. And the, and the second one is how people felt about the public squares, their ideas, their inspiration, their feelings, how what they thought was friendly and what they thought was not friendly. So we had a, um, a combination of qualitative and quantitative elements. And uh, if you want, I can send you the questionnaire so that you can see the, the, uh, the sections we were working on. Uh, these days, we were working again on uh, the effects of COVID uh, with a student of mine, but we are uh, uh, we have used the um, questionnaires for um, from for Gail, uh, if I'm saying right, Zam uh, Gail, and we are using the methodologies that will uh, that show us uh, the before and past of the pandemic. And I'm, I'm afraid I'm not so clear, but it's a little bit complicated, and I wish I were there to to help you with the workshop and explain you what uh, I'm talking about. That's okay. Thanks. That was amazing. Uh, is there any other question that we would like to pose to Ms. Dumeli? Someone from our students? Participants? Okay. Uh, Ms. Dumeli, we cannot see you because uh, you are sharing your screen. But uh, <laughs> if you stop one second, so we say. So thank you very much okay. for your presence and for okay. your intervention. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation. And I wish you the best on your workshop. If, and if I can contribute in any other way, let me know. For sure, for sure. Perfect.
Thank you. Oh. We will okay. Uh, we will pass now to the second round of lectures that will be, uh, we said today it's a hybrid version. We have first a remote, uh, the remote presentation by Mrs. Dimeli. Then we have colleagues presented via videos. They, we have uh, three registrations um, of three colleagues coming from different environments, Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Uh, we will start with the first one, which is um, Mrs. Uh, it's, a, it's a joint presentation by two scholars, two colleagues of ours, in, uh, called, um, which are Mayra Tito, a lawyer in public policies and management at Nova Law Green Lab, and also Marcelo Crivani, an environmental and urban sanitation entrepreneur at Agendas de Omeo Ambiente. And their presentation has a title, Environmental Agents and the Issue of Social Network Technology to Promote Sustainable Development Goals in Cities. From the colleagues here about the best practices in uh, the city of Kanya. So, we will be presenting our experience with the environmental agents and my colleague Marcelo Crivano will introduce himself and do the presentation after me and I would just like to make a brief introduction. My name is Maíra, I have working as an urban lawyer and practitioner in Brazil for over 10 years and um, I'm also uh, currently a PhD candidate at Nova School of Law in Lisbon. We also have a research center there where we focus on environmental, urban and energy law. And I also work with the GPN, the Global Pandemic Network, under the coordination of Professor Cristiana Lauri, who is also coordinating uh, us here today. So in this time, uh, working as an urban lawyer and practitioner, what I have noticed is that we have some challenges to overcome concerning implementing SDGs in cities. The cost of maintenance of public spaces are high, the, the civil society is not always engaged, and also we have a massive lack of data to analyze and therefore make uh, interesting decisions. So I think this solution of the environmental agents uh, helps to overcome these challenges, as Marcelo will show. And I think it's an experience that is worth to be shared and maybe will help us to build more sustainable cities anywhere in the world. Well, thank you all for being here today. And I will now leave the floor to my colleague, Marcelo Crivano. Marcelo? Thank you, Maira. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Professor Valina, to open this opportunity to us to share with you our last two years of research and work about how to engage and educate citizens to act in coordination with SDGs and to make the most sustainable cities for us. We are uh, a social network of residents, which is rapidly expanding throughout Brazil, in many cities now. Uh, and we organize into small micro urban areas with three kilometers uh, of perimeter. And we explain to you how we got there and how we engage those neighborhoods in, in tasks to improve the urban environment. We start the project in 2016 when a technology division was created at the engineering company I work for that has been providing environmental infrastructure, infrastructure services in South Brazil for over 20 years. Our first goal was to coordinate two different logics. First one, uh, the view of public service on streets. Uh, the matrix that the company performed was entirely based on streets, on the daily fleet of trucks, cars, vans, and people who every day leave garages and cross city streets to perform services such as cleaning public spaces, streets, parks, squares, and perform maintenance of small problems 
and do some collection of recyclable waste and we have to coordinate that with the second logic that was the logic of the blocks of the population that resides and the neighborhoods and the vast majority of the population that lives, consumes, uses public spaces and are constantly demands assistance from the public authorities without leaving the place where, where they live. Well, in our analysis, we identify three uh, big problems. First one, the high urban environment maintenance costs. As uh, those uh, services are performed by people working directly on the streets, uh, we have a, a lot of costs related to logistics, transportation, and, and supervisors, those kind of things. And second one, a very, very big difficulty in the education and the engagement of citizens. We, we also realize um, in those studies that the neighborhoods farthest from the center that did not have these service regularly were the ones that had the most difficulty in educating and coordinating uh, their population. And the third one, uh, the lack, the completely lack of data, local data. All the surveys that we had assessed to were surveys with national base data. We ended up at the city scale. There was no data to show and to study about each neighborhood, each area, each block. For us, it was practically having to work, to work in, in the dark. Uh, we, in our understanding of the problem, we designed a digital platform with the objective of create a social network of residents in which users were rewarded for environmental tasks uh, in their homes, in their neighborhoods, like a game, like a Pokemon Go. And our goal with that mobile app and, and a web-based uh, platform was establishing local leaders to multiply sustainable behaviors, to promote paid environmental tasks for citizens that live in those areas, and to create a database of georefer information status and about the behavior for social and consumption and governance. We, we test and we study and we analyze many, 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 many solutions throughout the world, and we choose three examples that we have to mix on to create our solution. First one, uh, experience in Los Angeles, California. Uh, they call it the Clean Streets LA initiative. That's a project in which the city of Los Angeles began to listen to residents about the cleaning status of their streets. And with that, they create a local database for city governance based on really local, really local information. The second one, uh, block captains of the city of Philadelphia, a very rich experience that began in the 80s and that empowered residents to be the local leaders in the maintenance and the care of their blocks, of the blocks where they live. And an American social network called Nextdoor, which promotes integration between neighbors and, and made them to exchange information and services and everything that they, they think it's about their really neighborhood. And that is something like a green engine where sponsors uh, provide a cashback money to pay tax for residents. All those tax are related with some of the SDGs. 
and they receive those rewards in a digital account. We perform our MVP in three big cities in in state of Paraná, Brazil, in the city of Curitiba, that is the capital of our state, uh, the city of Paranaguá, that's it's, uh, is the port city uh, with 150,000 uh, inhabitants and the city of Maringá that's in the countryside electing 2021 as Brazil's best city to live in. And uh, I'm going to show you some of those experiences. First one is the city of Maringá. This is late, late uh, 2019. Here uh, we have the pleasure to, to meet some of residents that really makes difference in their neighborhoods. First one I'm going to show you, like uh, Mrs. Luzia, Mrs. Luzia and her sister that lives right on the block in front, our really good example for us. Let me show you one day of Mrs. Luzia uh, working in her block. So, as you can see, we can provide a really, really uh, detailed data about the performing of Mrs. Luzia and how she collects information and clean her neighborhood uh, and provide some of of data that the municipality doesn't have. Um, this was a very, very rich experience for us. And we also had some, some examples of her sister. That is, is Mrs. Erminia. As you can see here, uh, she provides us really, really local information that can allow the municipalities to, to work on and to understand how detailed they have to plan those services. Uh, a very important thing was the engagement of the neighbors and we experienced that in another city it's, it's, it's about Maringa also, uh, when we hire uh, a local to do the maintenance of nine blocks, that's where starts our understanding of that urban micro area. And we have, we have many, many, many experiences from Klesia here, and we can show you some this day and as you can see she walks through her block and do some research with locals asking questions about the city about the city cleaning service about uh, practice and also he reached she reached her street with that with that uh, that state of cleaning and provide uh, the service that the neighborhoods need, and we also here experience the connection that emerge between uh, the locals and one of of their neighbors that now is the local leader that collect oil, collect garbage, uh, and helps all the residents in, in, to make a better neighborhood uh, to live. We, in one year after that, we, we did a bigger experience now with a new platform, new coding, when we, we hire 70 local entrepreneurs, micro entrepreneurs, and we, we gave them 70 small areas to, 
to to care about. As you can see, the experience was made in together with the municipality. So we have public public officials. So doing the doing the checks of all those data, and as you can see, we can govern do the governance of one small area uh, using those local leaders to provide the information we need and to react against those problems. And the other experience of, was in the city of Paranaguá. Let me go there. When that's that's our latest test here, this we we engage all the population in in a cashback game with sustainable tasks to perform, and we have uh, amazing results with engagement of those of those residents. Uh, we're talking about small money, small rewards, like 10 cents, 30 cents, one real, but we can, uh, we, with those little tasks, we can help them to understand and how to perform and how to, 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 to have better, better uh, behavior. Uh, about our environment. Uh, so, uh, after those those tests, we have uh, some results. I want to share to you. Uh, approximately 70% of our early adopters were unbanked women in their middle 40s. It's uh, we find a lot of lot of women that cannot have a regular job because they have to to care about their children, their, their houses, and so when we offer a local service, a pay local service for those women, uh, they are the, the vast majority of, of our users. So 87% of the residents that we, we, we we interview, they had never heard about SDG goals. So this is a very, very scary data. And we have uh, wonderful results about the perception of the residents, about the cleanliness of, of the areas. So 70% uh, provide a positive valuations of those uh, service, 65% users uh, start adopting sustainable habits that they never heard before, and 90%, uh, over 90% of those, they said they would recommend the uh, my app to their neighbors and and friends. Now we're going to our phase three, so we're spending. We we're working on some reverse logistics certification, carbon credits. It's amazing for me that that carbon credits market. It's on, now it's only about big companies. We we trying to understand better how uh, that market works and maybe to provide small amounts of carbon credits to people that engage in those in those tasks. We are also working in better uh, provide a link between those tasks and SDG indicators. So we're working in a matrix with uh, over than 800 tasks that can be performed by residents, and each one has one specific SDG goals that we can measure, and, and then we can we can have that big picture. To go. And this is it. This is our team. Uh, we have a multi diverse team working on that. A lot of experience here, a lot of work. Thank you for everyone. There are many of them that are not here in the picture because we don't have, we don't have space. 
and we also did some some research about Kenya and in our map we we went to Greece unfortunately not <laughs> presidential and we found that if we apply our methodology to the city of Kenya we think with 101 citizens Kenya can can do all that experience in the city so this is it uh, I hope to further contact with you guys we have a lot of data to share and we expect to get in touch with you and to help the understanding of public spaces in the city of Kenya. Thank you, everybody. I hope uh, you enjoy the presentation. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayra and Marcelo, for the very interesting presentation and uh, the very interesting methodology you have shown us, shown us. And it was very nice also seeing how it applies to Hanya. Uh, we, we would li really would la really love to see also next steps and how we can visualize more uh, the work we have done. Uh, if there are any questions for this uh, part, uh, we can gather the questions, send it to our uh, uh, lecturers, and uh, we can uh, uh, make them engage later in the day. Please um, uh, write down your, uh, your questions and let us know, okay? Everybody. The next presentation is called The Smart Enough Cities in a Resilience Scenario, Recovering Public Spaces, and it is by Dr. Maria Luisa Gomez Jimenez, Professor of Administrative Law at the University of Malaga. Malaga. Uh, we are welcoming her and uh, we are thanking her very much for her contribution to our conference today. Device is always uh, which is giving us more happiness. On the other hand, we are facing a resilient scenario coming out of the pandemic, and does make us to reflect also on the needs, on the real need of population. We have to recover our spaces in our cities. We have to recover our public spaces, and that makes us also to believe that we have an opportunity to change things. Because we this is Kenya, or La Kenya, as we would tell in Spanish. A beautiful, wonderful city close to the sea, projected to the Mediterranean Sea, looking towards their fissure, updating in a projection that needs to be very close to other places around the European area. And this is Malaga, the city where I am from, and which is also showing some connections with the city of Kenya, as you can see from the picture. It has also the sea in the background, but the thing is that green as you might think out for this picture, because it's not raining as much, but that historic site relevant also some connection with the history, as a lot of uh, things to share, an element to share between these two uh, Mediterranean cities. We are trying to deconstruct today, we are thinking today on how to make those city something that can be relevant for updating your city in this workshop on this conference when I'm taking the opportunity to participate. Let me please to introduce myself. My name is Maria Luisa Gomez Jimenez. I'm administrative law tenure professor at Malaga University and I'm very glad to Great, give you the welcome here and grateful for your participation and grateful for the invitation to the Global Pandemic Network, first place the working group which is working in the COVID city and governance in the United Nations Habitat for a Better Human Future and also the Technical University of Crete and all the sponsors and organizers of this conference to make it possible. The idea which I bring you here in this short uh, appeal is to make you to reflect about the important the significance of uh, smart cities but not just whatever smart city but the idea of a smart enough city. What do I mean by this? Oh, let's think for a second. How smart is your city? How do you plan it to be? What do you expect from your smartness? <laughs> if you want to think about it for a moment, you will realize that we are always running and running, trying to get the best out of everything, which at some point is fine, but at the same time, getting too much blind with the idea that the faster, the better the device is always, uh, which is giving us more happiness. On the other hand, we are facing a resilient scenario coming out of the pandemic. 
and does make us to reflect also on the needs, on the real needs of population. We have to recover our spaces in our cities, we have to recover our public spaces, and that makes us also to believe that we have an opportunity to change things. Because we're working in creating sustainable cities that also need to be healthy cities, with healthy housing all around. Of course, this picture is neither from Kenya, neither from Malaga, but I wanted to illustrate a little bit to see this high of the global diversity we are all in. Because we are thinking globally, we have the Sustainable Development Goals as a goal for our activities in this number 11 goal, which is connecting the cities as com sustainable communities at the micro and on the macro special scales. Just to point out through four ideas that I could perhaps reflect here is the notion of mobility in connection with the ecosystemic approach because we have discovered and we knew from the beginning but now it's much visible than before that we live in a holistic ecosystem and that our environment is very much affected for our actions and that we have to take care of the sustainable elements that are around us. Uh, this means also to take care about all the common spaces and areas where we are living and to give some value to this communication and technology that was showing that relevant during these pandemic times. Communication ICT technology makes us believe, make, feels connected, and also makes us believe that we are in a smart city. But what this means exactly by a smart? Uh, when we think about sustainable, many people made the mistake that they think is just putting more green around, is creating this green in the buildings and the spaces, which is part of it, but it's not relevant, or it's not the more relevant of it, because we're looking for finding a kind of equilibrium, but it's also so just integration, the integration of this technology which can make into the definition of other things like the smart homes and the smart cities as a whole thing, and also with this connection about what it means to be a little bit more healthy. Uh, the technology changes our life and makes us uh, our day by day supposed to be more easy with the use of artificial intelligence, automatization of process, the integration every time more and more coming stronger, the idea of robots around that, who came to stay. And we are forcing us, our European Union, to take steps towards an European liberal regulation, which are their dark and sad areas. I will not go into detail now. But technology can help us also in the cities to understand what is going on in our public spaces. This is an example coming out from Valencia City, where they were trying to tackle and trying to, uh, to guess to know what this was going on with the waters and the quality of waters uh, were detected through this use of technology. Also the case of Bilbao, when they were having a huge transformation toward the a gray, uh, from the gray to the green and blue city, and make it even more connected to the environment. But how uh, can we implement this in Kenya? What can we do to make this better? We are going towards open spaces. We go from the social isolation to a social integration. We try to make it feasible under the European Union the scope, so taking into account basically the European Green Deal and all the policies that have been implemented to make it work. And this policy we are talking about that we have to be connected and connectivity is a key in our life, is making us at the same time to realize that this connection is going farther than we even could expect at the very beginning. We expect to be connected the whole time. But is this really possible? Think for a second. Do you have all the connections you need? Is that enough? Everybody is able to access to this connectivity. How do we organize that this distribution of the different resources can reach everybody without creating a, what is called a digital divide? And the agenda for recovery is also pointing out the idea that we cannot leave anyone behind. We have to take into account all the possibilities and we have to project this in our Published spaces. The digital divide is bringing us this kind of equilibrium that we want to get when we are fighting against that division that creates technology between those who have the access to the technology, those who have the digital skills to use the technology, those who cannot even know how to command those technologies. If you want to analyze this, you probably have to bear in mind this classical graph about the four perspectives to analyze it, which is not including the W referring to the place because we are running everything about the 
place of Kenya where we are. Just think for a second, we have a key issue here. These digital skills are working all around us because of European Union, there is a lot of work to do. This, for instance, is an example coming from the European Commission from the Digital Scores Board, where you can see clearly how many countries that under the median of the average of people who have the capacity or the ability to use these digital skills. So we mind the gap. We want to have a, a city which is detecting vulnerabilities. We are creating a space for everybody, and we need to approach it from a different perspective. We have to open our eyes and to create this new path, which make us uh, believe that there are other possibilities and solutions. For that, what do we propose? From Malaga University, we are working very hard in this research area, but also I propose you to be innovative. This is a community of innovation that creates solutions that can make a new path, that can make the difference and can uh, fight strongly against this digital divide. We have also to build in the solidarities. One thing we have learned out of this pandemic is the idea that there is kind of a virus of insolidarity. People just think too much in themselves and they do not think enough in the others. So making us together like common humans uh, needs uh, can help us to create better spaces and better solutions and also to prevent like the last point of this uh, short introduction to prevent uh, for future pandemics, for future stress situations, for future crises that, you, that we might face inside the world city. Because we hope that our cities are livable, are sustainable, are connected, and that's making us believe that this is possible also in your city, also in Kenya, also from Malaga. So go ahead and do it and take care in between. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy my presentation. See you. Kenny. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maria Luisa. It was an amazing presentation. Um, and again, if someone has a question, we can uh, write them down and uh, co contact later our, uh, our lecturers. Uh, we will pass now to the next 10-minute uh, video. It is from uh, the Professor Chiara Ravagnan. Um, this time from Rome. Uh, she's an adjunct professor of urban planning at Sapienza University of Rome. And today she's going to present us um, her contribution, which has a title, uh, Green and Social Networks for Urban Resilience Between Health and Empowerment, European Practices. Good morning to everyone. First of all, I would like to thank uh, very warmly the or members of the organizing and scientific committee, uh, in particular, Cristiana Lauri, Valina Heropanta, and uh, Gianluca Crispi. Uh, more than honored to participate in this international conference and workshop and to bring the activities uh, uh, developed at Sapienza University of Rome. Uh, in particular, my intervention will relate to green and social network for urban resilience between health and empowerment, um, developing some uh, uh, reflection about European practice. My intervention is articulated in three parts in order to deepen the research framework and approaches to urban regeneration. The, um, to illustrate some uh, uh, main uh, emblematic practice uh, uh, in order to um, deepen the relation between urban regeneration, in particular at small scale and digital social network, and also to um, have a brief description of uh, some ongoing experimentation uh, uh, developed at Sapienza University that link research topic and didactic activities. The research framework uh, relates uh, to the activities uh, carried out at Sapienza, in particular in the research group of the Department of Planning, Design and Technology of Architecture, uh, with particular reference with the uh, activity carried out with uh, Irene Poli, as well as uh, uh, within the activities of the National Institute of Urban Planning. Um, these uh, research activities are strictly related to the didactic activities carried out in the Master Course of Architecture uh, Urban Regeneration, where I am adjunct professor. Um, and uh, the main results of uh, these uh, activities 
um, that relate to a multiscalar and integrated approach to urban regeneration, uh, focusing on the public space, uh, are published in uh, a book, uh, Regenerare le città e i territori contemporanei, uh, as well as in uh, international and na national articles uh, published in uh, scientific journals. These uh, research activities are based on a uh, reflection of years on the problems of contemporary cities, in particular on the central issue of uh, uh, public space uh, in relation to the effect of the industrial crisis um, of the last decade, but also on the um, effects of uh, global and financial uh, economic crisis of 2017, as well on the uh, recent effect of pandemic. In particular, pandemic uh, has underlined uh, the importance of environmental and social sustainability of uh, public space as a matter of uh, equity and uh, urban uh, resilience and uh, has underlined how the health uh, problem uh, are uh, related to the uh, access of uh, uh, public space and green space uh, and uh, the quality of urbanization. Many studies have demonstrated how there is a direct correlation between social isolation, loneliness and poor health, such as heart disease, dementia and immune function and so how uh, it is important to uh, focus on the uh, rebalancing of the access and presence of uh, green uh, in urban areas in, in particular, how green and public space network can be considered regeneration matrix uh, uh, that can also foster a socio-economic rebalancing. In order to build this uh, green uh, and public space uh, network, the research framework uh, is aimed at combining uh, bottom-up practice with uh, top-down practice in order to um, mend uh, a general vision for uh, resilient cities uh, and also the quality of uh, small-scale projects. In particular, uh, the quality is related to the quality of a project but also to the quality of the process involving uh, communities, uh, citizens, uh, stakeholders, um, in the regeneration process. Uh, in particular, uh, in, in our research path, we have deepened the different uh, process of uh, and tools for uh, regeneration from the uh, regeneration programs of uh, of the the final the, the, the final decade of the last century uh, that uh, uh, focus on the integration of uh, physical action with uh, with social uh, involvement of uh, communities uh, and also uh, uh, to the uh, the research path have focused the importance of uh, some arising approaches to small-scale projects developed in France, uh, like in the Aménagement d'Anticipation, uh, and also uh, in the tactical urbanism um, that is now uh, developed at international level, but that started in the United States, more or less in the 2010, and that uh, um, outlined the importance of uh, short-term commitment at first step uh, toward long-term changes. Uh, this, uh, this approach is also related to the community project, in particular developed in, uh, in England, uh, that uh, uh, underline uh, the importance of the experimentation in quick project also to contribute to a long-term vision. In particular, the coordination between a public vision of local authorities and uh, bottom-up practice um, 
held by communities on a small scale uh, project of uh, public, scale, public space are very important in order to uh, achieve the uh, sustainable development goals and particularly the goals 11 on sustainable cities and communities. Uh, as you can see from some emblematic images, the, um, the project on uh, public space can, of course, uh, uh, contribute to um, face the inclusion of uh, the vulnerable uh, categories such as disabled people, children and the elderly. In the framework of this uh, research uh, topic on urban regeneration and uh, public space and this, this particular approach, uh, I would like to point out some important uh, practice rel in relation to digital social network for urban regeneration. On, uh, so the digital social network are understood as information and communication tools for self-organizing and collective collective intelligence processes. In particular, as we can see from the following uh, practice that I will very mention very quickly, uh, we can see the uh, importance uh, of the, the opportunity that arise from this, uh, the use of this digital social network for four phase of the urban regeneration processes. The public consultation and that reach in order to define shared goals and areas of, for the project. The dissemination of best practice and shared guidelines for urban regeneration, in particular on public space. The interaction and collaboration between stakeholders and the founding, implementation and management. The first point relates to the role of a digital social network in the public consultation and outreach in order to define shared goals and area for regeneration. I think uh, it was important to mention the practice developed in Bergamo called BG Public Space. Uh, collaborative uh, mapping that was the result of a collaboration between uh, the University of Bergamo, the municipality of Bergamo, uh, that uh, achieved to, um, through the collaborative uh, mapping, to include the opinion of citizens uh, in the first part of the elaboration of an international competition aimed at revitalizing the center of uh, Bergamo. This um, a practice uh, is, uh, was carried out uh, in the framework of uh, the theoretical perspective of uh, the learning city, uh, pointing out the role of, of public space uh, as an expression of the identity and also the importance of the uh, collaboration between inhabitants and authorities uh, where inhabitants are seen as builder and manager of its own territory. The second point relates to the dissemination of best practice and shared guidelines that, uh, as we saw fr uh, from our uh, research activities is a very important uh, point for the quality uh, and uh, efficiency of urban regeneration. In particular, I would like to underline uh, two practice. Uh, the one uh, was uh, developed uh, and is ongoing at the moment in, in Rome that was fostered by the UAP studio in Rome and is called Zapata Romana that uh, uh, refer to, um, on one hand, an interactive and collaborative map on urban garden and community-led green areas uh, that can also uh, enable the um, consultation of uh, practical guidelines to start uh, urban gardens and shared gardens and uh, uh, that is very important for uh, the awareness of the citizen on this uh, topic and uh, also indicate the availability of area to be allocated for shared gardens uh, and also um, can, is a very important repository of material and information on shared garden at international level. 
the importance of the dissemination of best practice uh, and uh, guidelines is also uh, underlined in the French practice uh, for green programs, in particular Naturenville and Ecoquartier. Another interesting point relates to the role of social uh, digital network uh, to strengthen the interactions and collaboration between stakeholders. One emblematic experience is related to the City Hound platform uh, promoted by the Teaspoon Architects that uh, try to uh, link the active uh, citizenship and urban stakeholders um, interested in the reappropriation and regeneration of public space with the um, availability of residual and abandoned space that uh, are underused and that uh, are um, at uh, uh, the origin of uh, deprivation and unsafety for urban areas. The last point that I would like to illustrate is the role of uh, social network uh, in the founding, implementation and management of uh, urban regeneration process. Uh, there are many platforms on the web in particular. I, as an emblematic practice, I would like to uh, just mention the Space I have uh, platform, uh, a platform based on United Kingdom that uh, enable crowdfunding for projects uh, aimed at improving local civic and community space. This brings us to the last part of the presentation that relates to an ongoing experimentation carried out at Sapienza in collaboration with the TU Wien in the framework of the new European Bauhaus Initiative that uh, uh, foster an international and interdisciplinary debate toward beautiful, sustainable and inclusive cities. Uh, in particular, public space is one of the main issues and uh, uh, the, um, uh, this uh, initiative also um, underlined the importance of the quality of urban experience combining the attention to physical network as well as immaterial networks. Cultural framework and in the framework of the um, New European Bauhaus Initiative, we promoted this uh, uh, international and interdisciplinary workshop for uh, master theses and studios coordinated by Professor Dal Falco and Professor Yadrik and uh, where we participate with Professor Rossi as a professor of urban planning. As you can see, the works uh, try to combine the urban scale with the uh, small scale project and uh, also try to combine the intervention on physical network as well as on social network. Thank you for your time and attention and again thank you for the invitation. For any question you can find my email address. Thank you Chiara for the very interesting presentation. Um, we enjoyed it in maximum and uh, uh, if someone of the participants here have any questions you can uh, um, write it down and we can refer it to, the, the, to, to Chiara later. Uh, thank you again. Um, now we pass to our last lecture for today. Uh, we are changing also modality. We don't have any more, any more uh, digital uh, online, uh, no, I'm kidding, we don't have a video anymore. We will have Professor uh, Parthenios um, from the Technical University of Crete. Um, Professor Parthenios is um, an expert in, architectural, in uh, digital technologies in architectural design, and he's also the director of uh, Digital Media Lab at the Technical University of Crete. He is here, he, he's here today and he will do a very interesting uh, lecture with the title Building Information Modeling and Digital Twins in Smart Cities, What's Next? Hello, everybody. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank uh, the scientific committee for inviting me here. 
and uh, most of all, uh, Professor Hiropanda, Valina, for this wonderful event, and the whole, all the people who organized this, and you for participating. Um, I'm going to zoom out a little bit from all the wonderful things that you have done today and yesterday. Uh, should I do something for the presentation to start, or you're going to start it? Okay. Good. Okay. So, I'm Panos Parthenios. I'm an architect and a professor of digital technologies and architectural design. And um, I thought I should get you a little bit out, see the big picture, and hold one word at the end of this lecture. I'm going to tell you which that word is. First of all, we are from the side of the technology in the architectural design and in the whole cultural, digital cultural media. Uh, in the digital media lab that we run at the School of Architecture, we do lots of stuff with uh, advanced 3D modeling, VR, AR, XR, and also music and architecture. But besides all these nice tools that we play with, Mostly, I would say, because of Professor Yeropanda, lately, in the last couple of years, we started playing also with the notion of the smart city. And uh, because, as you have already understood, Valina came with a lot of power and a lot of strength from Italy, and she brought with her uh, brilliant ideas for innovation, we also got in the game to see what technologies we as architects and planners and designers can use in order to improve our city from the perspective of the user and the habitat always. So, my favorite dilemma has always been the world between digital and analog, and my students know that. So, what we are mostly interested at is the, the line that you see that supposedly divides it, these two worlds, which actually connects them, they don't, doesn't divide. This hybrid new world that is being created out there. We have already passed three revolutions to come to the fourth, where we left behind the whole thing of the mass production, the computer, the automation, the mechanization, and now we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution where Cyber, physical systems, networks, artificial intelligence, bots, hybrid spaces play a role. And while we're in this world, I think we should never forget that the keyword for today, at least from my point of view, is data. You heard it many times today and yesterday. Many of the wonderful lectures spoke about data and how we get data through participatory design, through open access, through other things. But I want to zoom out a little bit and, and focus on the importance of data. There are many ways to uh, read the news. But for example, they say that 25% of jobs in the States are going to be lost in the next couple of years because of the fourth industrial revolution. So people are going to lose their jobs and machines are going to take over. It sounds very scary, and it, it, it is scary. And if you see, 75 million jobs are going to go down. And you see the jobs, the declining jobs. Many of, many of the professions that we know are going to go away, which is very scary. But 133 million new jobs are going to emerge on different subjects, and look at the subjects. Data analysts and scientists, artificial intelligence, software, big data, digital. So you see that we have a shift from the old world to the new world, and we need to be prepared. As I always say to my students, when something new comes as a tool or as a technology or as a, a, new, a new approach, we should not be afraid, we should just learn how to tackle and get over it. So, for example, the whole COVID crisis has accelerated the digitization on everything. And you can see the numbers, how, how much they go up 
through the COVID crisis, but acceleration, acceleration doesn't mean necessarily something positive. It means that whatever is, was going to get better, it will get better faster, and whatever was going to get worse, it will go worse faster. So we're in an accelerator that things are going to go faster. Both ways, it's not positive or negative. So what do we do as architects and designers? In the fourth industrial revolution, is it possible that we keep designing buildings and cities the same way that we have been designing for years, for decades? Is it possible that our cities keep, keep functioning the same way that have been functioning for decades or centuries? I believe not. And what we should be focusing on is what we call an emotionally smart ecosystem, which is based on the keyword that I told you, data. Let's have a look. Connection is a spark that gives our video. lives meaning. Maybe we should lower the lights a little bit. I'm not sure. It drives us to seek out watch. others who feel well, the same no, way. We can't. Okay. Why don't you input the data and we'll take a look together. Hey, Mari, what you got for me? To find those who share our views, yet offer different perspectives. Saw this next. Look over here. Challenge us with new ways of seeing. This is not science fiction. It's a tool out in the market Keeping right now. our understanding. And enrich our lives. Great things happen when we commit to something bigger than ourselves. Let's take a closer look at it. Place this here. Let's see how we go from there, okay? This sense of collaboration. So basically, and the what you see the there is a new tool that allows hey, the emergence of the physical and digital world, but right not through a screen or a device. We but have two on the real right world. On the same trajectory. As we put people first, technology fades into the background and feels like anything but. Asia, what do you think? I think we had 330, maintaining 2800. So, me that we'll I'm here, here physically, approach. and somebody else who's the somewhere else, else the through digital and in turn, means, actually start to merge for the These first time. Great, actually. There's promise in the possibilities, and what we see and create next will stretch the imagination. Good morning, Sarah. Morning. Slowly coming towards the thumb. A world without boundaries. Good job. A lot better than yesterday. Yeah. Excellent. Slowly bring the A world down. where technology enhances, not limits, humanity. With people front, center, and in the spotlight. The future so is for here. the first time, the virtual and world here. becomes and dominant. Anywhere. Introducing Microsoft Mesh. Okay, this is Microsoft Mesh. It's one product. But I want, I want you to keep the idea behind it. The idea behind it is that the virtual world, the digital world, suddenly starts to become more important than the physical world. And for those of you that have heard of the word of NFT, the non-fungible tokens, for example, you, you, will, you will see that the digital copy, the digital twin, as we start to to say it, is more important or more valuable than the actual thing. People are selling pieces of art, supposedly, or why not a design of a house or a city? They are selling it more expensively than, more expensive than the actual a product, which is physical. You probably heard that somebody sell um, a piece of a plot in the digital world, let's say, Imagine a virtual monopoly or a virtual city where the plots can be sold, people can buy it, they can virtually build, and all this for lots of money, even more expensive than the actual world. So suddenly owning a digital clone of the actual world is probably more important or more valuable than the actual thing. Or somebody could say that the virtual clone of me or you could be more important than the actual selves. They, sell, they sold the house in San Francisco, not the house, sorry, they sold 
a replica, a digital replica of a house in San Francisco for, I think, half a million or something for the, the digital file of the house. And as a gift for whoever bought that digital file, they sold also the actual house. So the, the digital part becomes dominant. The way we have been designing has changed completely. This is early urban planners designing cities. Designing or drafting or, or drawing lines because they're drawing lines. And then we went into uh, tools like AutoCAD that we all love to hate, which is still drawing with lines. We're not actually designing, we're drafting. And with lots of implications, when we try to design something and this, this digital version of our drawing down there actually gets built up there as a cloud and the contractors do not understand the difference between the digital and the actual. And they take the real representation of the digital drawing and make an actual copy of it. And then BIM comes along, many years ago, actually. When I did, actually, my colleagues do not know that my proposal for my PhD in the States in 2001 was a description of the BIM that was coming. And that's how I got in the PhD program in the States. And then I changed my PhD. But then BIM came and promised lots for us architects that we're not going to stand into 3D. We're going to go into four, five, six, seven Ds dimensions. And we're not going to be only graphical. We're going to go into non-graphical. And what's the keyword? It's data. So instead of drawing with lines, now you draw with objects, and objects have data on them, and they start to become a reach, and one uh, or two lines are not a door anymore, but a door is a whole door with materiality, with cost, with a schedule, with uh, many things that are being attached on the object, and that was BIM. But BIM is already old, unfortunately. So now, we're starting to talk about the, the digital twins, which is the next generation of BIM. What's the difference of the digital twin? How, how a digital twin is different from a building information model? The difference is that the digital twin is real time, and it's a digital clone, as the word says, of course. So we try to put as much information as we can, all kinds of information, on the digital model, and the two models need to be synchronized all the time. So whatever happens to the one needs to be synchronized to the other. And then you get the chance to simulate, to visualize, to do things that you weren't able to do before. And lots of things can happen there. And data, of course, again, is the keyword. And especially for cities, you understand that the digital twin is incredibly, incredibly useful. Let's watch a short video. Cities are complex ecosystems. Behind the buildings and beneath the pavement are vital systems that keep our daily lives moving, such as water lines, traffic signals, power grids, and more. Data from these systems can not only provide us with an intricate understanding of our urban habitat, they can also be used to create a digital twin where changes can be modeled, simulated, and visualized, providing fresh insights to improve sustainability, resilience, and livability. All of this is becoming possible because of a new virtual platform created by researchers in Georgia Tech's School of Civil and Environmental Engineering called a Smart City Digital Twin. Since its inception in 2017, interest and research on the platform has grown rapidly. Cities are actively using digital twins to understand stormwater maintenance, improve public transit and mobility, enhance emergency response, and analyze energy consumption patterns. However, while many are finding great value in small-scale smart city digital twin deployments, the technology has yet to be fully utilized on a full city scale. 
a fuller integration of data streams across infrastructure systems into a smart city digital twin will allow large cities to access deeper insights that will enable them to better understand, predict, plan for, and even react to the complexities of urban living. Take, for instance, the example of a fire in a tall urban building. A smart city digital twin could alert first responders of the emergency, provide real-time updates and predictions on the extent of the emergency in the critical first minutes, notify the power grid and water supply of a need for increased resources, adjust traffic signals to divert traffic away from the scene, allow first responders to arrive on the scene more quickly, and enable building occupants to evacuate to safety. With a smart city digital twin, we could actually test this scenario over and over to ensure that we have identified the best solutions for this and other emergencies, while at the same time improving the sustainability and livability of the city. In short, a smart city digital twin represents a necessary platform toward integrating, visualizing, and operationalizing many complex data streams to transform our cities and our experiences of them for the better. For more information, visit Georgia Tech's School of Civil and Environmental Engineering online. So you got an idea of what a digital twin can do. And as you heard, you can run over and over again the scenarios and see what's the best output for, for the real world. And what, what do you need in order to run all these scenarios and simulate accurately, real time, all this data? You need super strong computers, of course because you need, to, uh, you need to do that in real time. And I'm just showing a slide here to tell you that we are in the process of acquiring one of those supercomputers in the School of Architecture in our university, where with the help of NVIDIA, we're going to create this supercomputer uh, with lots of power in order to be able to run these scenarios and try to build this uh, scenario of digital twinning. But Georgia Tech, as you saw, the, the example of the digital twin also has done something very interesting. They're, they're, they're doing great research in Georgia Tech uh, between the notion of artificial intelligence and human. Um, there was a, an experiment for three or four years, I'm not sure, where one of the Georgia Tech professors um, had uh, a few assistants, TAs, in his classes, and after a couple of years, he revealed to his students that his assistant was actually not human. It was a robot. And this assistant was actually responding to the students' questions very naturally. The students were very happy with the answers. And after the end of the year, nobody understood that the professor, the assistant, was not actually a human, but it was a robot. Nobody could understand the difference between a human and a robot which sounds a little bit tricky, I would say, right? It's, it's not, it's not we, don't, we don't feel very comfortable with this. So now I can reveal to you that Professor Parthenia was not able to attend this meeting, so he sent me as a bot of himself because Professor Parthenia was getting married two days ago. So I'm not gonna be able to get many questions from you you can ask Professor Parthenius. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you if you don't receive questions, maybe you need an update. <laughs> But thank you anyways, that was, that was wonderful. Uh, do you have questions? Are there any questions for um, the robot or for Professor Parthenius? Both of them will, uh, will reply. Someone? Okay. Then we will stop here for today, uh, for, this, uh, for this part. Now there is a, a very small uh, coffee break and uh, we will proceed to the final part of today, which will be the last uh, work session. Okay? Okay, thank you very much, everyone.